Good morning and <clears throat> welcome to Bethel Baptist Church, 9 a.m. Daily Devotions. And it's a <clears throat> real privilege to be back again, uh, to be able to bring a short devotion uh, for all of you that are watching. So <clears throat> this morning, I'd like to teach on the subject of the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And the verse I <clears throat> want to have you look up in your Bible right now is 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16. <clears throat> For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. When it talks about the flesh here, <clears throat> it denotes mere human nature. The earthly nature of man apart from divine influence and therefore prone to sin and opposed to God. When it talks about the eyes here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, uh, the, uh, the word is metfa, metfa, and it means the eyes of the mind, the faculty of knowing. When it talks about pride in this verse, it's referring to pride as being empty or braggart talk. And so it's an insolent and empty assurance which trusts in its own power and resources and shamefully despises and violates divine laws and human rights. It's also an impious, pardon me, an impious and empty presumption which trusts in the stability of earthly things. When it refers to the world and 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16. It's referring to the ungodly multitudes around on planet Earth. It's referring to the whole mass of men that are alienated from God and therefore hostile to the cause of Christ. The whole circle of earthly goods endowments, riches, advantages, pleasures, etc., which although hollow and frail and fleeting, stir desires in the hearts of men and women and seduce us from God and our obstacles that cause us to walk in the ways of the world and not be holy as the Lord is holy and follow his precepts, ordinances, statutes, and commandments. <clears throat> the lust of the flesh is the passionate desire for self-satisfaction, which springs from the corrupt, sinful tendency found within the sin nature of man. The term flesh does not refer to the physical body in this verse. It speaks of the lower aspect of sinful human nature, that which is sensual. The lust of the eyes refers to the higher aspects of sinful human nature. It is the inordinate desire to feast the eyes on things which are seen, whether they're good or whether they're bad. The pride of life focuses in material things rather than the eternal. These three charter traits, if prevalent in our lives, are in opposition to God. Christians are instructed in Scripture not to be conformed to or contaminated by the world. The devil, through the spirit of Antichrist, holds the world in unbelief it is by faith in Jesus, the Son of God, that we escape from the world and thus overcome the world and become overcomers, as the Bible teaches. Listen to these verses in 1 John 5, 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. In verse 5, 
Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 2, verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written, which the man knoweth, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. In chapter 2 of Revelation, moving forward a little bit in verse 26, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Revelation chapter 3, 5, he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. In Revelation 3.12, <clears throat> I was quite excited last night as I was reviewing the message for this morning. And um, when I came to the end here, and it's not that I haven't read this verse over and over many, many times since 1980, but uh, something really stuck out as, uh, to me. Uh, in the last three words here. And so listen to what it says in Revelation 3.12. He that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Now, I got excited when I got thinking about the new name that the Lord's going to have. And so I wanted to study out what this was really saying here in the uh, original Greek, in the Strong's Concordance. And I wrote it out, and my writing is such as uh, a physician, which is hard to read sometimes, so if you'll just bear with me as I and try to read my scribble here and give you the explanation of what this new name really means here. The name is used for everything which the name covers. Everything, the thought or feeling of which is around in the mind by mentioning, by hearing, by remembering the name i.e., for one's rank, for one's authority, for one's interests, for one's pleasures, for one's commands, for one's excellencies or deeds, etc. And I really got excited when I stopped and meditated and thought on this of what all consuming name would Jesus Christ have this new name that he'll be rem remembered by? And when you and I, the elect, the saved, the ones that are born again, and when we're there in the new Jerusalem with the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father and the Holy Spirit and all the holy angels and all the Old Testament and, and all the saints up right up to the last one get saved during the tribulation not just the tribulation period, but even uh, in the Millennium Kingdom, I should say. Um, <clears throat> what name will that be? That all-compassing and all-consuming name that Christ will have that in a split second of time that will realize who Christ is, 
what Christ has done for each of us, what Christ has accomplished. And so I went off to retire for the night. And as I lay in bed and my wife was trying to sleep, the thought came to me, the restorer of my soul, the restorer of my soul. And I got so excited, I had to get up and I had to go and write it down because if you're like me, when we, when we get these thoughts or we have a dream that the Lord's trying to communicate with us, sometimes um, we can't remember in the morning. And so I went down and I got up and, and probably disturbed my wife and I went immediately and wrote down Restorer of My Soul. As I was driving in <clears throat> to have to uh, tape this message here <clears throat> this morning for the day that it'll show on the internet, and listening to my uh, music in my car, it, I started thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ and I got thinking about God the Father, how his name means the self-existing one. I'm wondering if possibly the new name of the Lord Jesus Christ in the new Jerusalem might be, for instance, the self-sacrificing one. I have no idea what his new name is going to be, but I tell you, I'm excited to think about it. And I give you this challenge. You think about it and meditate it on. Think about everything that the Lord has done all through Scripture, and especially when it comes to redemption of mankind, of an all-consuming and all-encompassing name that could be, na uh, could be used for, for Jesus to go by. And if you come up with something, whether it's in the Hebrew and, 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 and uh, transliterated into English or the Greek translated into English, and you come up with something that you think might just be that all-encompassing name, would you encourage me? Would you email me that, that at preacherdavidoxer at gmail.com or would you send me a text at 519-774-4248? I'd be excited to know what your thoughts are how you're led in that regard. Irregardless of what that name is, it's going to be an exciting time. Let me get back to the message. I got off track here and went on kind of a, a rabbit trail as I do from time to time. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and, and am sat down with my father in his throne. Revelation 21, 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Now let's quickly review some scripture in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, where the Lord directed me to consider the lesson Solomon had learned. <clears throat> it is evident from the account of Ecclesiastes that Solomon started out enjoying all the pleasures of this life that satisfied the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. <clears throat> In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 10, And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Solomon soon recognized there was no prophet under the sun in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 11. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no prophet under the sun. Next, Solomon determined wisdom excelleth folly in comparison to how light excelleth darkness. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 13. Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly as far as light excelleth darkness. A quick examination of the narrative so far reveals that a wise man exhibits spiritual perception 
Well, the opposite is true of, of a foolish man who submerges himself in continued spiritual darkness. The regrets of the wise rise when the heart, pardon me, when their heir to one's estate inherits the wealth and the thoughts enter the wise man's mind of whether a lifetime of labor will be wasted in a fleeting moment of time. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 18 to 20. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun because I should leave it under the man that shall be after me. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? Yet shall he rule, pardon me, yet shall he have rule over all my labor wherein I have labored and wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun. This is all vanity. Therefore, I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. Once we all, like Solomon, acknowledge the striving for success and accomplishment is in reality the end, uh, it is in reality really nothing. And the only lasting satisfaction is to maintain a correct mindset as we're instructed in the word of God. Ecclesiastes chapter two, verse 24 to 26. <clears throat> there is nothing better for a man that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw that it was from the hand of God for who can eat or who else can hasten hereunto more than I. For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. Our reward from God in this life is wisdom and knowledge and joy wisdom and knowledge and joy. I have one last closing verse I wanna hold off because, <coughs> excuse me, the Lord gave me this thought as I was driving up. <coughs> God is wanting us to avoid the lust of the eyes, of the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. And he reminded me of the top angel that God had created in heaven, whose name was Lucifer. And Lucifer was the most beautiful angel that God had ever created. And he was like a five-star general. And in his wings, he had tabards. God created him for God's pleasure to be an instrument of praise. But pride entered in to the heart of Lucifer. God not only gave a free will to mankind, but he gave a free will to the created angels as well. And this pride, as he tried to be like the Most High, was his fall and his doom and his destruction. And God, it hurt the heart of God as this pride welled up. Most likely in my mind, all of the heavenly host was, which is innumerable as the sands of the sea. When they would look at Lucifer before his fall, they must have been in awe. And because he was the head and the free will of the angels, one third of the heavenly host fell and God cast them out of heaven and down to the earth and chained most of them. We realize now that Lucifer is referred to and called the prince of the air and the power of the air and he is Satan. He is the great liar, the deceiver. He is the arch enemy of God. He is the arch enemy of mankind. And it was pride that took him down. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that God hates seven things. 
And you can see that in the book of Proverbs. You can look it up on your own. I'll preach it sometime if, if the Lord wills and leads. But pride was one of the most prevalent ones. <clears throat> and so don't let the lust of the eyes, don't let the pride of life, don't let um, these things come into your life. And I'll try to keep them out of my life because they're very destructive to us. And as I'm coming into your homes, you're, you might be in your car right now on a lunch break, viewing your phone. You might be at home <clears throat> sitting in the kitchen or in your living room or somewhere having a cup of coffee or, or eating your lunch or whatever and looking at this uh, devotion right now. And I want to speak to you just for a second. Some of you are saved. Some of you are older. Some of you are associate pastors, assistant pastors, possibly pastors, deacons, Sunday school teachers, junior church workers, bus workers, but you're not involved in ministry in, anymore. You're not in the local church anymore because you've been hurt, you've been offended. Might've been offended by a pastor, by a deacon, by a member, by an adherent in a local church. Don't let your pride keep you down. God wants you to get up, shake that pride off, shake that bitterness out of your soul and get rid of that. God wants you to come back. And I, I know this is a terrific, wonderful ministry that I have the privilege to be involved in. And they allow me to come here and serve the Lord here. These folks, they're, they're wonderful people here. And for those of you that have left Bethel, you're still wonderful people. And if you're out there and you're hurting, Years have gone by. I've talked with some of you. I've only been here for a short time since 2017, but I've talked to some of you as you've come back from time to time and sat in the pews and shared with me of your hurts. God wants you to get over these hurts. He wants you to put this pride aside and he wants you to come back. Please, I beg you, would you do this for God? Would you confess your sin to a holy God? Lay your pride down. when the church door is open and we're allowed the privilege to come back. <clears throat> God wants you to get in your car and come back to church. <clears throat> I want to close out with this verse in Galatians 5.16. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Father, we thank you now for this time. I pray that you'll bless this message, Lord. Take it forth in great power, Lord, into the hearts of those that are hurting and are just consumed and destroyed by this thing called pride. Help them, Lord, to be overcomers. Heal them, Father, and bring them back to the local churches where they once again can worship you in spirit and in truth and fulfill your will in their lives and be used in a tremendous way here at Bethel Baptist Church or in the local church where they have left. I ask this in Christ's name.